Hello, beautiful light, and welcome to another episode of From a Medium's Perspective. Today, we're going to have a master numerologist, Lloyd Strayhorn, who is an author and astro numerologist, join us. Welcome. Hi, Thank um, you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm just tickled that you could join us. I'm going to take a minute and tell our listeners a little bit about you, if that's all right. Yes, sure. sure. Okay. Lloyd Strayhorn is a master astro numerologist, which means both astrology and numerology. And he's also an author of several books. He grew up in Harlem in New York. And I really love what he said on his website about having an unusual interest as he grew up in all things weird, strange, or interesting. And I thought, woo, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd, you're an Aquarius 7. I'm a Sagittarius 7. So there was uh -huh. a reason that we're kind of doing this. I have Aquarius rising. And Lloyd, you have always been fascinated by the other world. And your study of astrology and other science has really been primary in your life. Although you have a pretty impressive background. You've got sales and real estate. I can second the real estate. I used to do that too. You've got some experience with insurance and a substantive background in publishing and even music. But you keep coming back to this. I don't think all of our listeners might guess how prestigious a guest you are. So I want to brag on you just a minute. Not only have you written numerous books, news magazine columns, and articles on the events of our time, which I always find fascinating from the science of numerology and astrology, but he's been on radio and TV so many times and he's met someone that I've always wanted to meet, and that's Oprah Winfrey. He's been on her show. He's been on Geraldo, been on Regis and Kathy Lee, the Montel Williams show, Tony Brown's journal, et cetera, et cetera. He has really made a mark in the field of numerology. Was it your most recent book, Is Numbers and You? It's it's almost considered like a textbook for people learning that field. Yes. How does seeing the world through the eyes of numerology and astrology, what vantage point does that give you? That's an excellent question, Tracy, because I see the world totally different. When I look at people or events or situations, because of my background, I tend to see numbers first. It's like a it's like a professional dentist. You walk up to him. Well, he or she would be professionally trained in dentistry, would know from your smile, lack of smile. People who are in their respective fields, they can spot things right away. So Yeah, sort of the textures and patterns. I know they yeah. say that people that are geniuses can pull together random points of reference and put them together in a picture that makes a lot more sense to them faster than it does the average person. And they do that like dot test where you have like random dots and then it's like push yeah. a button when you start seeing a shape. I know what you mean because I think of it that way as being a psychic medium, I'm kind of pulling uh, things out of the ethers, literally, and putting them together. Tell me how that works with numerology and astrology. You've kind of got a double-powered pack. Tracy, let me give those who might be new to the term astronumerology. I am an astronumerologist because I'm combining the best of both metaphysical worlds, astrology and numerology. To those who understand it, numerology, of course, deals with your sign, the planets, the aspects. Numerology deals with its own, except it looks at it from a numerical perspective. But when you put both of them together, it makes a big difference. Let's say you have somebody born June the 9th. Well, we know that that's a Gemini. As a numerologist, I would say, oh, she's a number nine. As an astronumerologist, she becomes or he becomes a Gemini 9 person. And this is what got me into numerology in the first place, Tracy. Because why aren't all Aries assertive? Why aren't all Cancers mushy or romantic? 
the little notions that we have for all the zodiac signs. And I found that the birthday is what modifies it. So, for example, I'm sure you've heard it too. Well, you know, Gemini's are two-faced. They, you know, they fly to you, this, that, and the other. But if you talk to a person born, let's say, May 26, 2 plus 6 is 8. Eight is one of those numbers, like the number six, under the sign of Gemini, that really settles them down, really gets them to take a moment to focus and whatnot, that they are tend to be more of a practical side of the Gemini rather than the more impulsive side, which is often described to the sign. Yes, um, I've always wondered about that. I've always thought sometimes there seems like there are sort of some characteristics that you can pick up on but it's not always there, and that is interesting. The birthday that modifies or alters or shades, however term you want to use, the sign. I'm going to say, I wonder then, maybe I'm not a Sagittarius 7, maybe I'm a Sagittarius 8. Is it by the birth date, or is it the life path? Yeah, the birth date. The birth oh. Date. What month and day are you born? Not I was here. November 26th. 1959. Right. So you would be a number eight. Now, when you said a Sagittarius seven to the uninitiate, for those who are not aware, you were probably referring to when you take the month and day you were born, November yes. 26 to your year, if that factors out to a seven. That's interesting because when I started, that technique is correct. You would still be correct that by adding one's month, day, and year of birth, that tells you what grade you're in in the school of life. So that means if your destiny or birth path or soul path, there's so many interchangeable terms they use from adding up the month, the day, and the year you're born is a seven, that would mean symbolically you're in the seventh grade in the school of life. Oh, okay. You're here to serve, to analyze, to investigate, to kind of raise the curtains on things that are kind of esoteric or metaphysical, <laughs> That's like such interesting. as your shows. We seven tend to be our own best company. We don't like a lot of people in our business, but yeah. we're always trying to raise people's awareness. And we like to go deep in terms of asking questions for which people will misinterpret that being nosy or prime, or you really cross the line with that. Uh -huh. The nature of the seven is always to get to the bottom line of a situation. Oh, yes. Oh, that's really too cool. In fact, you born the same day as the illustrious performing entertainer Tina Turner. Oh, okay? cool. I've always uh, liked she's her. Born in <laughs> and she is so fabulous, just like you, Tracy. She's... Oh, please. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. But, but see, what happens is that once I know the birthday and the zodiac sign, it sets off for me a whole chain of events. It begins to create the building blocks to lay out what your seasons are in the years. Essentially, people will say, well, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. But very few people seem to ask, how can I be in the right place at the right time? Yes. And what happens is, well, in your example, when you said you were born November the 26th, and you are eight because two plus six equals eight, for those that may be wondering how that happened. Mm -hmm. So your numbers would be the eight, the three, and the six. Those would be your important numbers. Now, once I'm able to establish your numbers, then I can use that as my building block to determine your best days out of the week, which is always on a Saturday first, followed by a Thursday and a Friday. Actually, yours works backwards, although the week would say, okay, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Oh. You were Saturday 1st, Thursday 2nd, then Friday 3rd. Oh, okay. And not only that, but then it would tell me, see, okay, so those are the days in the week. Now, when I say the days of the week, what it means is, let's say you have an important interview or an appointment yes. or a test to take, and you got an option of when to do it. You should now do everything on a Saturday, a Thursday, or a Friday. Follow up on an interview Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Take a test Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Go into the hospital for a procedure Thursday, Friday, Saturday. In other words, anything that you want to go your way in a very smooth transition, it should always be done in your days. 
That's and, why I prefer to do readings on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Let me say this. If not, it's just a heck of a coincidence. Okay? <laughs> right? <laughs> but that's how people see it. When I tell them, you should see this light bulb go off, and they'll just say, wow, that coincidence. And I do understand, but really, there are no coincidences, not in the metaphysics. But then all dates in the calendar, such in your case, the 3rd, the 6th, the 8th of the month, the 12th, the 15th, the 17th of the month, yeah, because the top is 1 plus 2 is 3, 1 plus 5 is 6, 1 plus 7 is 8. Yes. Then you have the 21st, that's a 3, the 24th, the 26th, and the 30th of the month. But then, my dear, you have several months, which will always be in January, March, May, October, and December. So you have five months, and this is how your season is set up. When you looked at when you moved into your place, when you started your radio show, the birthdays of your parents, <laughs> They will always be in and around late December, January, late February, March, late April, May, late September, October, late November, your birthday going into the month of December. And it sets a pattern. It sets a tone. Oh, that's very interesting. I think what fascinated me, too, is the concept that astrology predicts sort of future cycles and things. But it sounds like numerology also can be used on a grand scale, like you're alluding to different scales. But beyond the personal level, does that work as well in terms of a country or in terms of a state or an organization? Yes, that's a great, great question you asked, Tracy, because in my best-selling book, Numbers and You, I list cities as well as countries that people can live in. For example, I have a CD on relationships, and I explain it this way. Why is it you can meet somebody for the very first time and you just hit it all? You know, there's a, there's a very comfort ability about the whole thing. It's almost as if you've known the person, so to yes. speak. And then there can be another time you meet another person for the first time, and they didn't say anything, they didn't do anything, but you're just not feeling them. Mm-mm. Well, we all give off an aura, as you would know, or vibration or frequency. Sure. And some aura or frequency is not as harmonious to one as another. So that's one of the crazy things about taking the New York City subway in the morning where you've got all these bodies crushed on top of each other in subways packed in the morning to go to work and return from work. And that's all that different energy mixed in. Mm-hmm. So they did a, a thing recently that little fights and little arguments are up in the subway system. But I can kind of understand that because people by nature need space. And then there's a lot of tension going on in the world. And then when you got everybody kind of all stacked into a situation like a can of sardines, mm-hmm. then it's, it's easy to see. So me, myself, I try to avoid rush hour. I try to avoid when they're out of school, kids are out of school. It just helps guide you in ways that are incredible. And what I'm saying, as I gave the illustration, so this is why one can go to a city or a country and do very well, go to another country or city and not do well at all. I have a couple of friends recently that have been talking to me One of them wanted to relocate for business. Another wanted to relocate for social things. And I know there's like geo-astrology. Is there some parallel in numerology as well? There is. There is. There is. Whoa. And you'll see it in my book, Numbers and You, where I list the best cities to live in, as well as the best countries to visit for vacations. Oh, that is too cool. So when you integrate astrology and numerology, because you're an astro-numerologist, right? Is that the right way to say that? Yep, that is correct. Absolutely correct. When you do an assessment for someone, or whether you call it a reading or a session or what you call it. I call it a reading, a session, consultation. All these words are Same here. (laughs) Same here. Yeah. 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 When you do that, Do you do that for your clients? Do you do a combination of both aspects of them? Yes, I do both. My emphasis is more on the numbers. Mm -hmm. But I definitely put an emphasis on the sign because most people 
if nothing else, know their signs, even if they don't believe it. And that's the funny part, to be on shows or make appearances, and somebody said, well, you know, I don't believe in astrology. I don't believe in the <laughs> signs. And I'll say, well, what's your zodiac sign? And yet they can tell me. Now, for somebody who doesn't believe in it, right. almost always they can give me an answer as to what their sign is. Right. So I was not bad when you think about it like that. Well, I kind of giggled because to me, it's sort of like the seasons or like the motion of the stars. It's like a natural cycle. And it's such an ancient art. It's not like somebody just woke up one morning and go, you're a horse, you're a cow, you're a pig. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. It's a deep science. I would gather that you would consider it, even though you've come to the level of function and success that you have, are you surprised by things sometimes or intrigued maybe is the better word? By- well, yes, yes, because I like to take the attitude of a youngster. A youngster by nature is very curious. They're very open and receptive to ideas. Their minds are not locked into preconceived notions or concepts. And therefore, I've always wanted to have a childlike attitude, not from the immaturity side of it, from the learning. Kids are always curious. That's why we get into trouble as kids sometimes, because sometimes our curiosity gets to the best of us. <laughs> we but do. It's the curiosity <laughs> that leads to self-discoveries, discovery new ideas and concepts in this very ancient field. So yes. you would think as long as numerology and astrology is around, why would you guys want to publish more books? But there are always new developments, new concepts, new innovative process and ways of doing things. And that's how I'm ever doing too. So I'm constantly learning. And by constantly learning, it keeps me open to grow, to evolve and be a better, more skillful consultant at what I do. Yes. And I think that that's a quality that makes someone an excellent practitioner of whatever their particular modality is, because it is that enthusiasm that not being childish, but being childlike, being open. I know you probably, like me, delight in making those connections for someone seeing that light go bing oh wow i understand or oh thank you that explains so much that to me tracy is one of the most exciting parts for me to talk to a client and then you begin to see light bulbs go off in their heads and it does become amazing it's a beautiful thing even though man will try to blow himself the kingdom come there is still order in this universe believe it or not Yes. And even though man, since the dawn of Adam and Eve, have predicted the end of time, the last days, the one thing I noticed, they're not here, but Mother Earth still is. Nostradamus has made predictions. Uh, other people, there was a farmer about two or three years ago that made a prediction. Don't forget, at 12, 12 is supposed to be the last days on 12, 12, 2012. Mm-hmm. Well, that is coming gone, and yep. those predictors are gone, and that I see Mother Nature is still here. Yes. So my experience has been based upon those kinds of predictions that I'm going to always hedge my bet with Mother Nature. Always. Yes. I have a question. Like the life path number, that's something that would remain stable because it's the day you were born. But I hear people kind of dispute, well, if you change your birth name, it doesn't do anything. And other people say, no, of course, it makes a difference because it's the intent and it honors a birth into a new stage of your life. What do you think about that resonance of a name? It's interesting. I love your question. The original Shakespeare once said, what's in a name? The response is everything. Mm. Well, numerically, which is what got me hooked into this in the first place is that it went further than the most metaphysical fields that required the month, the day, and the year you're born, the time, location, and maybe some other factors. Numerology took it to a whole nother level. It also included your name. We're doing this show now, right? Yes. So after about 10 minutes after the show's over, 15 minutes, people may be talking about their sign, their sign, and their number. 
But then they quickly get back to, yeah, Tracy, yeah, Lloyd, yeah, Mm so-and-so. Well, in numerology, the name in and of itself has a purpose. The name, according to the theory of numerology, denotes one natural talents, gifts, skills, and abilities. So even if you never stuck your big toe in an institutional setting, (laughs) elementary, high school, college, whatever the case is, well, all of us, according to numerology, still have some innate talent, gift, skill, and ability. How that is determined is by transposing the letters of the name into numbers. It's like decoding. You decode the letter from that name into this particular number. Now, there are two schools of thoughts here in the West. There is the Pythagorean system. That's the one that goes from one to nine, and they consider Pythagoras a father of numerology, the father of geometry, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay. That's the system that goes from one to nine. But the older of the two systems, known as the Chaldean system, goes from one to eight, and it deals with the esoteric side. If you tuned in late or you would like to listen to some past episodes, All the past episodes are listed on YouTube. Go to YouTube.com, put in Medium Tracy Lockwood, or you can go to my website at MediumTracyLockwood.com and look at the radio show YouTube page, and you can find all our previous shows. We usually have them up within about a week. If you're interested in contacting our guest, Lloyd Strayhorn, His website is Lloyd, L-L-O-Y-D, dash Strayhorn, S-T-R-A-Y-H-O-R-N, dot com. Welcome back. Thank you again for joining us today. I'm so happy to have you on the show. (laughs) Thank you, Tracy. I'm honored to be a guest on your show as well. Oh, well, thank you. Well, right before we took our break, we were talking about sort of what's in a name and whether it matters or not, whether your name is changed. And you were talking about the resonance of a name does make a difference because it denotes a person's talent, skills, their abilities. And you were starting yes. to describe the Pythagorean approach which was the numbers one to nine utilized for numerological purposes. Mm -hmm. There's an older Mm -hmm. system, the Chaldean system, that has just one to eight. And that's where we got interrupted by our break. Your recall is superb and excellent and bring us up to speed. The Pythagorean system of interpreting the name into numbers is much easier, far easier. So I teach a course here at the City College of New York here in New York. When I'm teaching the course, I use that system. This way, it more encourages potential numerologists, astrologers who would want to go more in depth. The Chaldean is when a person sits down next to me and they're spending their hard-earned money and valuable time with me, then I go to the more older, more esoteric system. Both are good. I guess people, when they get competitive, well, is my car better than your car? (laughs) As long as it gets from destination A to destination B. Absolutely. Bottom line. So they both work. Here's the difference, though. The Pythagorean philosophy and theory says you must take the name given at birth. But when I'm looking at a full-fledged adult, Tracy, they made a death oath. They would never share with the world their middle name. What are you to do? The Chaldean system is just the opposite. Its theory is you take the person's name that they're most known by. Okay. Which is what I like. Because by the time we evolve into young adults, we kind of know how we wish to be called. We identify ourselves by that name. Somebody will give a name, and it's not their real name given at birth, but it is an adopted name, a pet name, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And one of the most obvious changes for people who will tell you when a woman gets married and changes her name, it changes the whole energy. Mm. You'll be from Tracy Lockwood to Tracy Strayhorn. That's a totally, totally different energy. Mm. Thus, the married woman evolves. She grows or whatever the case is. And then she grows into her name. Yeah. So it's, it's most amazing. It's almost like a language of interpretation then. Well, it is. 
It's just going from one language to a numerical language and interpreting them. So, for example, if I saw a person with a lot of threes in their name, mm -hmm. it would indicate a youthful type of person in terms of appearance, actions, energies, deeds. It would denote a person who is more career-oriented than domestic-oriented. So if a man knew that he was about to marry a woman with a lot of threes in her name, mm -hmm. and his objective is to domesticate her, to make her, <laughs> as Rosie O'Donnell once says, a domestic goddess, okay? And right. Honey, now that you miss a straight home, your job is to stay home, dishes, diapers, laundry, raising all these kids around here. <laughs> That's not exciting to that type of person. See, we men don't understand that women have goals like we do. One is to be married, to have a feeling of security with a home and a family, nurturing, all those things that are very maternalistic to women and our survival that we men take for granted. We want to go off around the world and blow up everybody that came to come. And <laughs> so our energies are totally, totally different. See, a car is on the top five list where marriage might be on the five list of a woman. Uh huh. You see, so our priorities are different. But for women, if they ran this world for 100, 200 years, there wouldn't be no wars. Now, women can be catty. That's true. You ladies can be very, very catty with each other. So you don't want to try to take a community out. You don't try to kill a nation. You don't try to destroy people. Our ladies would build schools and nurseries and hospitals <laughs> and other things that make life enjoyable. I don't know what men are so afraid of. And mm -hmm. yet, it's so ironic because just recently they found that women pay more, like 14 to 18% more, for deodorant than I would, <laughs> for another beauty product than I would. And yet, on the flip side of it, women get paid less than a man at the job for doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So a woman is in a double squeeze to me. She's getting paid less than a man on the same job sitting right next to her. And yet, when she goes out to the store, she's got to pay a little bit more for hers than I got to pay for mine. So <laughs> I can understand women taking a stand, yes. women speaking up for themselves, and women saying, guys, this whole notion that you guys have been going through, that's about over for now. Thank you. When I think of masculine and feminine, I think of masculine energy and feminine energy, which doesn't always follow a gender definition there. In numerology... Is there a differentiation between masculine and feminine energies? You um, better believe it. And I like how you preface it, and not in the way we think of it, world stages, a male and a female. Uh -huh. We're talking about masculine and feminine in the metaphysical arena. It takes on a different connotation. Yes. When they say masculine, metaphysically, it means those signs and those numbers that are more proactive mm -hmm. about doing something. When we say negative, it means they're more mental about the way they do something. So let's take a sign like the planet Venus. To Taurus, that is the masculine, which means a Taurus is more action-oriented. But for a Libra, which is his counterpart, it would be more negative or mental in its way of doing it. Oh. And it's interesting because Taurus is an earth sign, which means more practicality. And Libra is an air sign, which means they use more reasoning. They use more of their rationale. Sort of right. Thing. That's you interesting. Know? So in summary, the odd numbers, one, three, seven, and nine are all masculine. Really? I would have guessed two, opposite. Um, huh? Two, four, Six and eight are all feminine numbers. I don't know why I would have thought it backwards. So if a guy was looking at a potential lady that he's interested in uh -huh. and then transposing the letters of her name into numbers, she has a lot of odd numbers. That means she's proactive. She's going to be action-oriented. She's going to get involved. She's going to get her feet wet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got a guy that don't want a woman like that, he should find nothing but a lot of even numbers where... It's not that they won't do things, but theirs is more using their brain power to do something rather than the physical. My name change, I started as Robin, R-O-B-I-N, and I chose in 2010 to change my name to Tracy, 
T-R-A-C-E-Y. And I went from a four to a nine. Yes. And I liked it because I'm feeling more like I'm getting things done. I'm, I don't know. It's sort of like my public persona. Some of my family still calls me Robin. That's because we're creatures of habit. Mm-hmm. But Robin four, and I assume you did it under the Pythagorean system, I would call it the number of secret enemies based upon jealousy, envy, and insecurity. And it's an even number. So it would be more feminine, in masculine feminine in that sense. Use its reasoning powers. However, when you change it to a nine, nine is the number of open enemies, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, nine is the number of courage and confidence. It's oh. the number that likes to control their own destiny. It is a humanitarian number. It is universal, international, uh, global, call it what you will. It is a number that brings out the best in other people. It is very inspirational and motivational. But it's called the number of open enemies because your courage and confidence is misinterpreted as being cocky or arrogant. But nine people are almost generous to a fault. They give selfless lead. Yeah. Their love is selfless love, things of that nature. And because nine is a fire number, the name Tracy, and Sagittarius is a fire sign, that makes oh. it even more apropos or beautiful to have it there. That means you would always be proactive in doing things. You wouldn't just be sitting around having a pity party. You would be, okay, snap out of it, Tracy. You get yourself a That's girl. right. Let's go out and make something Put your happen. big girl panties on and deal with it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's interesting. And you just mentioned a fire number. I never thought about the elements being tied to. The same thing that's on the astrological side of the equation is the same side on the numerical side. So the number one is ruled by the element of fire. Mm -hmm. The number two is ruled by the element of water. The number three is ruled by the element of fire. The number four is ruled by the element of air. The number five is ruled by the element of air. The number six is ruled by the element of earth. The number seven is ruled by the element of water. The eight is ruled by the element of earth. And finally, the nine is ruled by the element of fire. So you have, just like in astrology, all the four elements. Oh, but that except is... they're distributed in the numbers. So wow. if I see a person with a lot of threes, uh-huh. that tells me that's fire. And metaphysically, fire means people who are proactive. They're driven. They got a lot of drive. Get up and go. Yes. If I meet a person with a lot of earth numbers in the name, with a lot of eights in the name, it tells me that now I'm looking at a very pragmatic person. A person who, if in a movie as a action character figure, would never think about running down the hall and just jumping out the window before looking. They're just not going <laughs> right. to do it. Probably wise, yes. <laughs> but that's why they earthy, honey. They keep yeah. it real. They keep yes. their feet on the ground. Let us use a little yes. common sense up in here. Grounded. Where fire signs and fire numbers tend to be more impulsive. They'll just jump out there and then they're out there. And well, we pray that when they're out there, that it's a soft landing when they come down. <laughs> um, and usually they're lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's why you will have a person watching one of these movies and saying, how did they jump out the window and know there was some water down there? How was there was some grass down there? It would be our luck. It would be concrete down there. What about air? Air would I... use more reasoning. They would get there and look and says now, the common sense is if I jump out this window with no bottom line protection, I'm not going to live. They just use some reasoning. Air comes close to earth in that sense of they use their reasoning powers mm-hmm. to do things. And thus they will question and use the logical side of their nature to do it too. Oh, water? Yeah. Water would intuitively, water metaphysically means people who can feel things. They can sense it. They can't explain it. They'll say something to somebody, oh, you must have read that in the newspaper. You must have heard it on radio, or you must have saw it on TV. Water people or water numbers just have an inner knowing. They just don't know how they know. Yes. And then sometimes the burden of proof is on them when even making them sometimes doubt themselves. But when it comes to pass, they can say, aha, uh-huh, see? 
I, I consider that the psychic realm because it doesn't cross over into mediumship where you can identify and classify. Yeah, yeah, enumerate, yeah, exactly. But it is still the same information. It's just not categorized per se. So Yeah, well, yeah. that's why in the early 1800s and up to now, until recent, they used to call psychics sensitives. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That, that simply means they were attuned. They could yes. tune in and tap in and, you know, come up with amazing things that, it is. that I don't even see it. You yes. Know? But we all have a natural intuitive gift. Absolutely. That is the one thing that the creator is that he's actually left no one out. Fortunately, women in this culture, their feelings or intuitions or hunches about things are not tampered with. The unfortunate part for men is who have these same feelings, just like a woman, that we're taught to go against being or nonsense. dismissed. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. shame. And yet the intuition in a man can be just as strong if developed. Yes. But we're taught to go against those things, that it has to be logical. If mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense, what we're talking about. But men have it too, and I would encourage men to get into that side of themselves. That doesn't make them less of a man or whatever our ego is, but it will actually help them in games of chance in life when they have to make decisions, and sometimes they're not too sure to kind of tune into an inner side. There is so much to this. I mean, it's just incredible. That's why I can talk about this for hours. And hours. <laughs> I just never get bored. We've got about five more minutes to the show, and I have two burning questions, so I'll see if I can get them out. You know, we hear about astrological signs being compatible or not compatible. Yes. Um, so with numbers, are there numbers that are most or least compatible? Yes. Just as we know, there are opposition signs other signs that are very compatible, they are uh, the same with numbers. With the number one, they're very compatible to the two, the four, the seven, and the nine. For number two, they're very compatible to the six. Actually, they're very compatible to the one, four, six, seven. For number three, they're very compatible to the six and the nine. With number four, they're very compatible to the ones and the fives. Sometimes they draw the eight to them. Number five, they get along with every single number except the three and the eight. With the number six, they're extremely compatible to the number two, the three, and the nine. With number seven, they're extremely compatible to the two, the four, and the one. With number eight, the only number they're very compatible to is the three and the six. And then finally, the number nine, they are extremely compatible to the six, the three, and the one. By the way, I just published a brand new book. I don't think it's been out two and a half, three weeks. I didn't know. Lloyd's Numbers and You Workbook. So if you want to know how the numbers correspond to the astrological equation, you should pick it up. Just go to Amazon.com. You can download it on Kindle. Or if you can't remember the title of the book, just go to Amazon and type in the name Lloyd Strayhorn. And it's in a green cover, and it's called Lloyd's Numbers and You Workbook. It's a basic guide to understanding numerology. It's nothing fancy. And right now, I have a a relationship guidebook that should be out in about another month. I'll mail it your way. Um, Oh, wow. It's called Lloyd's Numbers and You Relationship Guides. It's a basic understanding a cosmic better way to an understanding of things. Then up the road in about another two or three months, I've got a real big book coming out called Lloyd's Book of Numbers, which is all the things I've learned in all these years. Well, I know the numbers in you, when I say it could serve as a textbook, it could serve as a textbook. It is not like sit down in an evening and browse through it. It is incredibly detailed and so many topics. It's a substantive work. I don't think I have time for my other question, but I'm going to just try to squeeze it in. No, I can't do it. Oh, oh, Lloyd, I wish I asked earlier, but I don't regret any of our questions. Thank Thank you you so much. Thank you, Dan. You have a blessed day. Oh, bless you. That's lloyd-strayhorn.com or mediumtracylockwood.com. We'll see you next week for a view of life from a medium's perspective. 
And remember, it's never inappropriate to be kind, and without integrity, you have nothing.